Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Nasaan man po kayo ng parte ng mundo? Maraming maraming salamat po sa pag-attend at pag-join po ninyo sa aming number 64, webinar number 64 or the 64th installment of the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. It also marks the start of our season 6. So marami na rin po tayong uh, napag-usapan na pagdaan at maraming maraming salamat po. At masaya rin po kami that you continue to join us during this learning journey towards learning more about the management and the treatment and all things related to COVID-19. We now have a credible online community and we hope that our community grows each and every webinar that we hold. So for the past few weeks po, no, medyo tag-ulan po tayo. Marami pong mga iba't ibang mga lugar sa atin ang mga binabaha. We have seen the photos of those who have been lining up para po mabakunahan. At kahit po medyo binabaha po ay talaga pong masugid pa rin po ang kanilang uh, pag-seek out na sila po ay mabakunahan. So we'll talk about all of those things today, especially the effects po of the torrential rains uh, that result in flooding and also how it affects the potential evacuation of maybe hundreds or even thousands of people po from low-lying areas. So we will uh, compare that against the backdrop of this highly transmissible variant of COVID-19. Maraming maraming ibang um, aspeto pa po and complex threats that the health sector needs attention and one of them is as uh, you could have uh, guessed is leptospirosis. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Uh, today, uh, we also is uh, marami rin po tayong iba't ibang experts. Uh, I know you have seen the different uh, posters and the different uh, social media posts and we hope you will continue to join us all the way through the end of this webinar. For those who are in the Zoom parties po, please uh, inyayahan nyo rin po na mag-attend ang iba pa po ninyong mga kamag-anak, kaibigan, mga katrabaho. Uh, but before we move on, uh, let me introduce, I'm very very happy, alam nyo naman po, every Friday, no? that I get to share hosting duties with my partner and uh, really our adjunct research faculty from the National Telehealth Center. She's also the Special Envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? Hi, Raymond. Good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. Uh, we are seeing so many people watching from all over the country. Mindanao, and dami, Raymond. No? First National Capital Region, our Metro Manila Hospitals, Quirino, Rizal, Amang Rodriguez. Welcome po sa inyong lahat. And um, as we continue, we're going to acknowledge uh, those who are participating with us today. And uh, Raymond has described our topic. We will be talking about uh, the risk for leptospirosis during a, a season where it's flooded. Pero alam nyo, Pilipinas kasi, we're the, one of the most disaster-prone countries in the whole world. So... Hindi naman tumitigil yung disaster dahil may COVID, di ba? So, kailangan nag-iingat talaga tayong lahat. But to get the context at ang pagkunawa ng pangkaraniwan tao sa topic natin na uh, COVID na lepto pa, andito po ang ating person on the street na ginawa po ng TVUP. Ito ay magpapagbako na pa din despite of um, having problems kahit um, nagbaha, may leptospirosis. Kasi yung vaccination ngayon ay importante. Unang-una, merong, meron tayong bagong variant ngayon na, na unti-unti lumalaki. Nag-increase yung number sa ating community. Yes, magkapabakuna pa rin ako because yung leptospirosis care could be prevented by um, using boots or wearing boots. And I think it should not be the burden of the people para mamili kung ano yung uunahin nila or kung ano yung iiwasan nilang sakit. Kahit na po umuulan, uh, kahit na po may banta pa rin po ng um, leptospirosis, eh, tutuloy pa rin po ako para magpabakuna laban sa COVID-19 para maproteksyonan po ako. Yes po, uh, for me kasi yung leptospirosis, uh, mas kaya siyang i-prevent compared sa COVID-19 na airborne talaga. May takot din naman po at the same time, pero kung gusto mo po talaga magpabako po na habang umuulan, kung willing talaga or para lang po ma-lessen ano, ma yung uh, matamaan ng ano, 
COVID po? Nagkakaroon po ng leptospirosis kapag po ang isang tao po ay lumulublub po sa tubig na meron pong contaminated po ng ihi ng daga. Sa pagkakaalam mo kasi yung leptospirosis para po mapasok siya pag may sugat ka somewhere na pwedeng pasukan. Siguro uh, yung pagsusuot ng, ng protect, protective gears like pagbota. I think in, in the grander scheme of things, <laughs> Kailangan pong ayusin ang sewage system. Kung hindi natin yun ayusin, patuloy pa rin babaha. Dapat po maging malinis po yung pamayanan natin para at least po kahit na bumaha, wala pong daga na mamamahay. Uh, kailangan, ng, kailangan ng information dissemination sa mga tao how to avoid leptospirosis and kung makakuha man, where to go, what to do. Kung talagang gusto mo may paraan, kung ayaw mo may, may dahilan. So tingin ko kailangan pong Um, maging yung mga tao, kailangan nilang isipin yung safety and security ng lahat sa baha, pero kailangan pa rin pong magpa, magpa, magpa-vaccine. For me, sa tinikilos po ng government is matatagalan talaga siya. Uh, although siguro matagal, pero we can handle naman po siguro kahit mabagal. Slow, ayun nga po na, slowly but surely po. As long as na meron pong ano, ang mga taong tumutulong and willing tumulong po sa kung ano pong meron tayo. Okay, we've got a great lineup of speakers for you today. Thank you, TVUP. Uh, maganda yung nakikita natin konteksto, anong inisip ng mga kababayan natin. At uh, maganda po ang ating pag-uusapan. Meron po tayong mga dalubhasa. We have experts today and I think we're all going to learn Uh, from this. Now, for today, we're bringing back the Mentimeter. So, I know some of you really like to use the Mentimeter. So, ito po ang Mentimeter natin. www.menti.com and use the code 9307-3652. So, especially for those who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can join uh, You can join our, um, our uh, what do you call it, fun quiz fun quiz natin. So, 9307-3652. Okay, over to you, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Uh, for those po no, who are wondering again, and also for those who are uh, participating for the very first time in our webinar, whatever questions that will be posted in the Zoom poll is the exactly the same uh, two questions that you will be seeing in Mentimeter. We have the Mentimeter, so we have po a way to engage those who are watching in the live stream po uh, in the Facebook pages of UP, Stop COVID Deaths, and TVUP, as well as those in the YouTube channel po of TVUP. Okay, uh, so I, I, we're trying to wait for uh, Dr. Tag, but I think uh, he might be uh, taking care of uh, some other business. Uh, so for today, uh, We will be uh, tackling a very very um, important uh, question po no as it relates to um, the flooding uh, to the Department of Health uh, the DOH has given warnings po uh, to the public uh, on uh, possible increase in the number of cases uh, especially ngayon pong mga tagbaha tagulan tagbaha Uh, there are those diseases that uh, just because COVID-19 has been top of mind for all of us for the past 500 plus days na po, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 520 something, um, that's, uh, that's sort of neglected po, but very, very important, especially in, uh, in light of all of the new CQ restrictions and classifications po. Leptospirosis po is not really a new Um, disease in the country. Uh, we, in the past, we've had uh, a number of cases in that and there is a treatment for it. But there are those symptoms na maaring mimicking or parang ginagaya po niya kung ano po yung COVID-19. So sometimes it may be very hard to tell that difference. So uh, we, we hope that uh, in this webinar, at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to understand po how to really identify and maybe determine po uh, if your uh, condition is more uh, caused by leptospirosis or COVID-19. Pwede bang, uh, maari bang magkaroon ng pagkakataon na sabay na meron kayo sa ganoong katawan. So that, that part of it, it's something that uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to 
uh, call from this webinar and uh, we really are looking forward to all of the presentations of our experts for today. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Okay, so let's start with our uh, fun quiz. And thank you for introducing the topic. Uh, Raymond, if Eric comes later, then of course he'll join us. And I'm sure he has a lot of information to share from the Department of Health. Uh, let's start with our fun quiz. So Raymond, over to you. Ano bang mga question natin ngayon? Okay, TVUP, may we have on the screen the ano, menti meet girl there we go okay so we have two questions po no ang dalawang katanong naman <laughs> meron na tayong graphic nag-level up pa yata tayo oh good okay sige go go, go, go. si Rata Tuwi yata yung sa umpisa so on the first question po is anong hayop ang nagdadala ng leptospirosis i'm seeing po that uh, there are well, there are only a few of our attendees who are able to um, input their answers po. No, please, oh, please don't be shy. Just uh, key in your answers po uh, in the Mentimeter or in the Zoom poll. Uh, we hope that we you could participate in in, in this fun quiz po. Wala pong um, grade <laughs> kumbaga, for this uh, fun quiz or poll. The options are as follows. Rats, option 1, option 2, dogs, option 3, cows. Option 4, pigs. Option 5, carabaos. Option 6, goat. And option 7, all of the above. Option 8, none of the above. Okay. We go on to our second question. Ang ating pangalawang katanungan. And please, do, for those who are uh, asking po, no, and maybe nakalimutan na nila, open your browser, go to www.menti.com and use the code that's on the screen, 9307-3652. That's 9307-3652. The second question uh, states, ano po ang mga sintomas ng leptospirosis na katulad ng COVID-19? We have as our first option, joint pain. Uh, option 2, muscle aches. Option 3, fever. Option 4, chills. Option 5, headache. Option 6, all of the above. And option 7, none of the above. So, we are seeing po, no? I think there might be a uh, problem po in terms of the poll uh, it might have uh, closed prematurely because we are seeing answers being typed in the chat box maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong mga kasagutan and we'll ask our oh there we go it's been relaunched so <laughs> pwede nyo pong mai-enter po ang inyong there we go thank you thank you ang inyong mga kasagutan not in the chat but uh, in the zoom poll po over to you Dr. Susie Nakakatuwa naman, Raymond. Ano? May mga pictures pa ngayon. Okay, so marami sa inyo sumagot sa chat box. Lipat na po kayo. Di, uh, it's on the Zoom. Yan na, kumahabol na. Talagang ano, ah, gusto, gusto nyo sumagot. Sige, tingnan natin kung comments. <laughs> Actually, ano, eh, no? uh, it's, it's always good to, to engage you and get your, your views on things. So later, we will ask our experts to answer this. Okay, so let's move forward. And um, as mentioned, uh, our country is one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. And, you know, it, the disasters don't stop just because there's a pandemic. In fact, <laughs> parang because of climate change, lalong nagkakaroon ng mga peligro, no, ng mga disasters, mga hazards. And recently, we've seen um, floods. And of course, ang concern natin dyan, you know, libu-libu yung mga nag-evacuate. Pag-evacuate, isiksikan, di ba? E eh, paano kung hindi bakunado yung mga tao sa evacuation center? Di, meron na namang piligro. Apart from that, yung mga, ano, yung mga rescue workers uh, lumulusong sa, ano, sa tubig na minsan wala silang PPE, wala silang botas. No? Ang daming ano, ano, pwedeng mangyari. And I think, you know, I think we're already tired. You're already working so hard na... Ano ba ito? Meron pang ibang mga sakit na lumalabas. Ngayon, yung iba sabi nga, eh, kinakabahan sila, dumadami yung mga kaso nila sa mga syudad and so on. Well, alam nyo, lilipas din yan, pero kailangan meron talagang pagbabago sa isip natin, sa pagpaplano natin, sa sa pag ano no, sa, sa paggawa natin ng, anong tawag nito, ng, ng mga paraan para matugunan natin yung mga pangangailangan pagkulusugan ng ating mga kababayan. So, para magkaroon tayo ng picture ng ano ba ang nangyayari sa maraming pagkamba, o ano ba, saan ba, ano ba, 
na, na ano tuloy ako eh, parang nablanko ako. Parang ano-ano ba ang mga hazards o mga piligro na expect natin maaring dumapo sa atin? Uh, saan ang mga lugar na, kunyari, saan ang mga lugar na bumabaha? So kung may mga lugar, alam natin ang mga lugar na bumabaha, dapat siguro nakatutok tayo dyan sa mga pagbabakuna. So kailangan ipagsama natin yung katalinuhan natin sa pag-unawa ng ng mga ano ng mga sakuna at saka yung kaalaman natin sa ano sa kalusugan. So, kasama po natin uh, hindi po siya bago sa inyo, siya pong executive director of the UP Resiliency Institute at director ng UP Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards or NOAA Center, Mr. Disaster himself. Kinakapatid ko ito. Alam mo, tuwing nakikita ko siya na alala ko yung tatay niya. All right. So, We will ma- welcome Dr. Alfredo Mahar Lagmay. Mahar, welcome to the webinar. Hello, uh, Susi. Oh, yan. Okay. Oh, kamusta ka na, Mahar? Susi. Okay naman. Uh, Nasaan ka ba ngayon? Hindi, sa bahay. <laughs> Magulo yung bahay, pero uh, na-COVID yan. <laughs> so, anyway, ready naman ako mag-present ngayon. Oh, go ahead, Mar. Oh, go ahead. All right, sige. Tingnan natin. Meron pang lumalabas dito ng mga poll, ah. Tingnan ito. Patagan. Oo nga. Okay. Share ko lang yung screen ko, ha? Bakit ang sinasabi dito, only host? Advanced sharing options. Hmm. Okay. Ano? You, you can share na, Dr. Mahar. Uh, ah, okay. Ano pa host ka na daw ngayon? Sige, thank you. Saan ka, ha? Okay, mali. Lagay ko, kailangan kong lumipat. While you're, while you're trying to... Okay. Sige. Okay na ba? Oh, ah, wala pa, Mahar. Ulit, ulit. Yan, yan, yeah. yan, yan. yan. Okay, okay. Sige, sumunod right. mo. Okay, I'm, go. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Stop. Okay. Mar, may his ng konti. Ah, may his. May his? Okay. Oh, eh, nawala uh, na. Nawala na. Okay. All right. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. You're perfect. COVID okay. na. COVID na. Lepto pa. <laughs> may malaki ang problema natin. Actually, hindi lang yan ang problema natin. Ano? Uh, we have a lot of problems uh, in the country. No? Uh, as, as we saw over the past uh, several one and a half years, we've been battling against the spread of SARS-CoV-2. No? And uh, it's really quite difficult. And uh, there have been many deaths already. And uh, because we also have other hazards, eh, baka makompound. No, yung ating mga problema. And uh, this is not unique to the Philippines. It is a problem worldwide, no? especially those places na maraming natural hazards just like the Philippines. What am I talking about? No? Um, bukod do sa leptospirosis, which I think is the topic of uh, uh, for today in this webinar, There will be a lot of speakers and doctors talking about this. We also pro- have problems about dengue, no, uh, and another uh, and other uh, infectious diseases. I've attended uh, other webinars, mga infectious disease experts who've been talking about uh, other infectious diseases that uh, pose a problem. No, uh, it's a continuous threat that we need to look at. No, we cannot ignore all of these things. Now, after having said that, I'd like to emphasize that there are other natural hazards that we also have to consider in planning. No? Uh, kailangan, uh, planning should be anticipatory. We should not ignore these things. Like, for example, before the COVID outbreak in the Philippines, we had this uh, very big eruption no uh, it, it was an eruption that generated base surges uh, we just published this 
in uh, scientific reports in of nature.com no? of nature and uh, these these surges actually is the most feared hazard i think of taal volcano it did happen uh, you're seeing there a picture of base surges formed in uh, the 1965 and subsequent years na may eruption from taal uh, generating base surges no in fact the term base surge uh, was coined uh, by a geologist, a USGS geologist, after studying the, this phenomenon occurring at Taal. No? And eventually, it got, uh, uh, got uh, mainstreamed into the volcanological literature. And many uh, uh, volcanic uh, volcanology agencies still use that term. You're seeing there in that very beautiful picture an elevation model of Day surges that form dunes, para siyang desert, no? and it's really very, it's 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 occupying. It was deposited in a big swath of land southeast of Taal Volcano Island, and you're seeing here the the photo of a school, depth ed school that got overwhelmed by the base surges. They tra travel at very high speeds; they're more than hundred degrees centigrade. And uh, definitely, if uh, students were there, uh, matay sila. it's a good thing that uh, there was our sleep time to evacuate the people. Um, so this is one type of hazard associated with volcanism. We also have uh, other hazards, like for example, more recently, we experienced bug. No? Uh, it's called volcanic smog. And it's because of aerosols and sulfur dioxide that uh, gets uh, to pollute the air. No? And uh, that needs to be considered because there are some medical issues when we inhale polluted air uh, like that, no? na tinatawag and na bug. And the bug was actually related to the uh, increase in SO2 emissions from Taal Volcano in the run up to the small erupt eruptions that happened, I think, early part of July. Apart from volcanism, we also have problems about earthquake activity. No? When faults move, there are many faults or earthquake faults in the Philippines. When they move, uh, they generate earthquakes. There are many earthquakes. In fact, as I speak, probably one earthquake is happening somewhere in the world. No? But uh, less frequent, yung mga malalaking earthquakes. But when they happen, we call it the, as the big one. And when it happens in a highly populated area, there may be uh, many deaths. And uh, if that happens in Metro Manila, we have many faults that uh, can move. They are active faults. And when they move, if it, it uh, affects Metro Manila, that will compound our response to COVID-19. You can just imagine that uh, all of these people will be staying outside. No, uh, They cannot stay in their house for fear that uh, there will be continuous ground shaking and make the, 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 the infrastructure or the, their houses collapse. So they will stay outside. Just, what just like what happened in Mindanao, for several months, yung mga tao we're staying on the streets. No? Uh, I don't know. No? So pagka nangyari sa Manila yan, in Mindanao yun, uh, less populated. In Metro Manila, we are highly populated here. No? Uh, several, ten, more than 10 million, probably 20 million uh, people. So pag nangyari yun, uh, people will be staying outside. And we might have a problem with controlling the spread of COVID-19. Apart from that, meron pa tayong mga ibang examples. No? Uh, yung earthquake, the most recent example na nangyari was the Batangas magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake. Uh, also recently in December, uh, maybe November or December, basta nung Ulysses when that happened, uh, it affected uh, several provinces no? um, in Luzon and it hit even Metro Manila and the impacts were, were heavy doon sa Cagayan Valley, no? uh, partly related to the dam release and uh, mostly related to the uh, 
heavy rains that triggered massive floods along Cagayan River. And uh, these are the things that we need to prepare for. And we also know that uh, because of that flooding event, nagkaroon ng, um, nagkaroon ng increase in, in COVID-19 infections in, in that area sa Cagayan. Apart from the natural hazards, we also have problems about uh, yung mga man-made. No? For example, this one in 2017, we had, uh, uh, sorry, in 2018, we had a rapid decrease of uh, the La Mesa water level. Uh, you can see that orange line in the graph. Uh, as compared to the 2017 graph, uh, we did not have any problems. But uh, uh, later on in 2019 and 2020, that did not have, uh, we did not have problems anymore because uh, the problem was fixed. Uh? So mukhang man-made yun because uh, uh, the rains, when we looked at them, as well as the uh, feeding dam, no? which is angat, wala namang problema. Nagkaroon lang ng problema sa Lamesa Dam. But uh, a discussion of this is very important. We need to uh, look at not only just at the natural hazards, but also things like this. No? Because if we have a uh, lack of supply of water in Metro Manila, for example, because there's no water sa Lamesa Dam, e wala namang problema dun sa ulan, um, magkakaroon tayo ng malaking problema kasi uh, more, I think 90% of the water supply of Metro Manila comes from this place. So baka magkaroon tayo ng problema. So it's not just the earthquake that uh, can uh, trip or, or break all of the water lines, pati rin yung, yung source no? na, na dahil hindi maganda siguro yung management or whatever it is. Uh, we need to look at that and secure our water supply. Kasi pag uh, wala tayong water supply, especially during the time of pandemic, eh, magkakaroon tayo ng napakalaking, napakalaking problema. Um, so we keep on monitoring this at we as well sa UP NOAA Center and the UP Resilience Institute. As was uh, discussed by Doc Susie, uh, earlier, sabi niya, natural hazards do not stop because of COVID-19. And that is true. Kasi the Philippines is in the Pacific uh, Ring of Fire and we're also in the typhoon belt. Uh, you can see here all of the typhoon tracks. We have about 20 that uh, enter into the Philippine area of responsibility. Uh, there are more landfalls, probably less than 10, that, uh, that hit uh, the Luzon and Visayas regions. And there are less that happen, that make landfall doon sa Mindanao. And we're also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, we share the same problems as the countries of Indonesia, Japan, uh, places like Alaska, uh, Western United States, Western Canada, Western part of South America. Uh, it's called the Pacific Ring of Fire because all of these places which have uh, a lot of volcanism and a lot of earthquakes surround the Pacific Ocean. So it looks like a ring, so it's called as the Pacific Ring of Fire. Now, when we talk about all of these problems about uh, uh, earthquakes and eruptive activity of volcanoes uh, and typhoons no, or severe weather, they're actually the phenomena. No? We really need to prepare against the hazards brought about by these phenomena. Like for example, when there's volcanism, what we need to prepare for are the hazards. No? Kasi the hazards are the ones that kill. Uh, like for example, for volcanism, the hazards are pyroclastic flows, uh, pyroclastic fall, debris avalanches, uh, ballistics, lava, noxious gases, and tsunamis. No? Uh, each and every hazard have corresponding maps. And everybody must know those hazards if it is present in their neighborhood. So kailangan tinitignan natin lahat yung mga hazard maps na yun. Uh, see if uh, they are present in your subdivision sa inyong neighborhood or in your schools or uh, maybe your your office place no? kung saan kayo nagtatrabaho. Uh, 
before you go there, you have to check whether there are hazards in those places. For earthquakes naman, uh, there are hazards. No? So the earthquake per se does not kill. It's the hazards that kill. And we need to uh, look at the hazard maps. Again, uh, know your neighborhood. These hazards for earthquakes are called ground rupture, ground shaking, subsidence, liquefaction, tsunami, sage, landslides, fire. I don't have enough time to discuss each and every one of these hazards kasi limited yung time but I just want you to take note that it's the hazards uh, it's the hazards that we need to prepare for. For severe weather like typhoons uh, we also need to look at uh, the hazards no? uh, just like for volcanism and strong winds, flood, landslides and storm surges. So I guess everybody is familiar uh, with all of these hazards that we need to prepare for, I just don't know if everybody is aware uh, whether these hazards are present in and everyone's neighborhood. So, gano ka na kayo yung score? Hello? May ano? Is the music part of your presentation, Dr. Mahar? Uh, no problem. Ako naman, ano, I naturally assume it's part of the presentation. It's part of the presentation. But, uh, it's part of the presentation. It's part of the presentation. It's part of the presentation. It's part of the It's part so, I ulit, guess, ulit, Mahar, ulit. Kasi hindi ka narinig eh. Yung music na right. nang-wait namin. So, for, for severe weather, like typhoons, no? it's, the, it's the hazards that we need to prepare for. Strong winds, floods, landslides, storm surges. I guess everybody is aware of these hazards. No? We've seen them. Uh, the strong winds, the floods, the landslides, probably storm surges you've seen sa TV what happened sa Tacloban and in the Central Philippines region. Uh, I'm just not sure if everybody is aware of the extent of the hazards or whether they are present in, in their homes, no? in their neighborhood or in their office area or in, in the schools where their children, where your children go to. No? Lahat kasi ito, they have corresponding maps. No? And when you know that there are hazards, like here, this one, this is UP. The, this is quite, the place is quite well planned. You see that lagoon, walang mga settlements. No? So even if it floods there, that's fine. But it's not the same for other places. So what we need to do is to know all of these areas that are hazardous, uh, especially if it concerns uh, the place where you live in, no? um, uh, your family. Uh, and know where to go whenever there's a warning. So again, uh, the, the point here is that we do not prepare for the phenomena. We prepare for each and every hazard brought by all of these events like earthquakes, uh, volcanism, and severe weather like typhoons and tropical storms. Now, uh, here is just a, a short uh, compilation of the lessons that we've learned from past disasters because we've been looking at the disasters that have happened in the Philippines. No? We, we are a, a natural laboratory for, for disaster research here in the country. No? Uh, and uh, we can learn a lot, of, uh, a lot from the, the actual disasters uh, to learn the mistakes in order for us not to repeat them. So I list here some of the short-term things that we need to do. Uh, Hazard-specific area focus and time-bound warnings. That's very important. Extensive use of sensors, use of maps that show where the safest places are in the community. We need to share. No, as bawal ang swapang sa disaster work. We need to share because the Sendai framework stipulates or the, the guiding principle is that we have to have a whole of society and science-based approach. No? So kailangan, we need to share the data sets, especially if they are publicly funded data sets. Long term, uh, we need to do anticipatory planning, put it into the comprehensive land use plans. 
we need to put the hazard maps or depict scenarios of hazards that are bigger than what we have experienced. That is uh, called as probabilistic risk assessment. And that has to be mainstreamed into comprehensive land use plans. Education, open data, that's very important. And uh, more scientific research. So far, uh, nagkaroon tayo during the COVID ng mga ilang mga typhoons. And I guess when Samar was hit by uh, typhoon uh, Ambo, no? typhoon Ambo, uh, very minimal yung uh, anong tawag nito? Yung, yung, yung damage, yung, loss, yung, yung fatalities. No? Five dead and scattered pa yon, And they managed well. And I think the reason why they were able to manage the, the typhoon uh, despite its impacts was because they were quite well planned. Remember that uh, they that that place was hit by by Yolanda, and uh, because of that, uh, there was a lot of help. Uh, those uh, municipalities and cities in in the Central Philippines region, especially Samar, were well prepared in terms of planning. Uh, they planned well. And uh, they were able to manage the, 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 the COVID-19 situation quite well, as well. No? So, uh, meron din tayo, so sa Ulysses, there was a rise in COVID-19 cases in Tugugarao. It was not really the same uh, type of disaster management as what happened doon sa Samar. But I guess uh, that's a lesson for us. No? How, how do we really do it? No? Um, and... Ito lang naman yung mga gusto natin sana maintindihan no? ng, ng maraming tao na we, we cannot ignore all of these hazards because they are all connected with each other. For example, itong COVID-19. That is just one example. We had COVID-19 and nagkaroon tayo ng problema sa agriculture, sa different sectors of society, no? sa, uh, sa health, sa forestry, sa energy, sa education, sa tourism, and we all know that. No? So planning uh, the, the municipalities and cities need to be done uh, across all sectors. Kasi hindi lang pwedeng sa health lang tayo, no? kung by COVID sa, uh, it's a public health issue, hindi lang pwedeng dun tayo nagpa-plan. No? We must plan against all of the hazards that I've just discussed we have to have maps and plan it according to the vision of the city or municipality of, of, of the community. And uh, just to give you an example, this is a land use plan. Uh, this is the storm surge map. That's the, uh, sorry, the, the flood map, the storm surge map, the landslide map. This is the uh, zonal plans of the community. Now, if we can put them all together uh, with the plans of the community, for example, this settlement area, uh, that I'm showing, one is full of yellow and orange hazards. That is not a good settlement site. No? One is without any hazards, without any color, uh, actually gray lang. No? That means there are no hazards. That is a good plan to, to make development uh, for, for settlements. For the agriculture sector, you can see their, their plants. No? Uh, ay, binabaha, but not all places are flooded. No? Uh, so maybe for climate change, they can plan resilient crops and for those areas that are not flooded, then they, they can uh, plant the normal crops. And this one, uh, which is a tourist area, um, we can, you can see that, uh, oh, maganda yung area sana, kaya lang hazardous. No? Kasi that's a good place where they can look at yung kalaw, no? na bird, na be, it's very beautiful. And uh, uh, that's a source of revenue from tourism. So what they can do is that uh, uh, during times na wala namang bagyo, it doesn't, these storms don't happen every day. Heavy rains don't happen every day. So uh, dyan sila, uh, continuous yung tourism, maraming pupunta. And then pag may bagyo, well, there's a warning from Pag-asa, they can pack up, go to the gray places, no? yung gray colored places which are nearby. And then when the storm is in the South China Sea, they can quickly go back and resume operations. Uh, that is called business continuity. You're planning for business continuity in the sector of tourism. Now, for our problems like uh, uh, COVID uh, compounded by leptospirosis and dengue, uh, we must uh, really look at the hazards. No? Pag bumabagyo, 
uh, diyan nagbabaha diyan din yung pinagpupugaran ng mga uh, ng mga uh, uh, tawag dito yung mga taga na tapos pagka lumubog ka eh baka yung ihi ng daga ay nandun sa tubig etc etc that will be discussed later on so we need to know these places we need to use science and technology to find out those places no and uh, make visualizations like this that uh, clearly show to us where they are no so that it can be communicated to the people kasi mahirap i-communicate ito and we need good visual tools no uh, like sa internet ano ba yung mga places na yan where to avoid them yung yung possible uh, leptospirosis and uh, really Uh, the, the, the most advanced technologies that we can make use of and the frontier science that we can also uh, make use of, no? uh, we have to apply for our disaster risk reduction and mitigation efforts. So UPNOA Center and the UPRI will be coming up with uh, a, a new website, a revamped uh, website that will show all of these hazards. No? Uh, for hazard-specific area focus and time-bound warnings. And hopefully, with this uh, 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 holistic approach in, in tackling uh, the, the, the natural hazards, the biological hazards, uh, we can make a better plan so that we can reduce the impacts of all of these problems that we face. I think that's it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk and thank you very much as well for listening. Thank you. Hey, thank, you. thank you very much. That's Dr. Mahar Lagmay of the uh, UP Resilience Institute. Nakatuwa talaga, no? Sabi nga natin, lahat ng kailangan ay kailangan natin para dito sa pandemia. And uh, Mahar works with a team who are able to do all this mapping. So maganda rin, ano? Minsan kasi sa atin sa health, tinitingnan lang natin yung tao, yung pasyente, yung bakuna. Pero actually, sa public health, malawak talaga dapat ang pag-unawa natin ng, ano, no, ng peligro. So I think uh, this is a good way to start our discussion kasi kung nakikita natin o alam natin saan talaga babaha, saan talaga, saan talaga merong peligro, makakapagplano tayo. And I think foresight or forecasting is going to be very important as we continue. So over to you, Raymond. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lagmay, and thank you, Dr. Susi. Next up, we have another expert, pero hindi po siya bagito sa atin. We've had him uh, for at least uh, two other times here in our webinar series. He is the head of the Adult Infectious Diseases and Tropical Medicine uh, section in uh, San Lazaro Hospital. And he will be talking about, uh, from the clinical perspective po, Uh, in terms of uh, leptospirosis and uh, essentially uh, our, our topic for today. So please welcome uh, to the webinar, Dr. Ron Jean Solante. Dr. Jean? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Raymond. And thank you, Dr. Susi. Uh, thank you also for uh, this opportunity to share also my our experience, particularly here in San Lazaro Hospital. We're also dealing with not only with COVID-19, but also with other uh, infectious diseases. But uh, at this point, I'll, I'll just have to share with you what, what are some of the important points that we need to remember. And hopefully this can also help you in your in the management of your patients with leptospirosis in this time of uh, COVID pandemic. So my, my first slide will really be uh, something that I think uh, related with uh, Professor Marlagmai's presentation that uh, our country is really uh, prone to this different infectious diseases. No? And uh, one of that is leptospirosis because of the flooded areas that we have, particularly here in the national capital region. And that in itself is really an important uh, epidemiological data. When you have a patient presenting with fever, presenting with a uh, cough or anything to do with uh, an acute infectious disease. And uh, some of the, the areas here is There are similarities with COVID-19 and uh, in a healthcare facility where you will be catering not only for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, it's really a big challenge for us to, on how to separate one over the other or in some situations where we also have patients with both infection, leptospirosis and uh, COVID-19. Uh, just to... Uh, uh, 
give you some data here. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, DOH leptospirosis uh, 2021. They said that uh, there is a 13% increase in leptospirosis compared to 2020. So which means that um, this is driven by the fact that uh, we have more rains compared to last year, more flooded, early flooding this year. And uh, uh, there is also a higher, uh, slightly higher fatality rate of around 11.4% compared to 9.8% uh, last year. So I'll, I'll start first with, uh, with a sample case. And this is one of our cases with leptospirosis. This was a case that was diagnosed with leptospirosis during the early first month of the pandemic last year. And this is something that uh, we didn't forget because uh, uh, this presented with some overlapping manifestations with that of COVID-19. This patient presented with fever and headache and then uh, eventually had vomiting and LBM. And I think these were already signs of metabolic acidosis. And uh, what was really important here was that we got the history that this patient was wading in flood water. And uh, the chest X-ray revealed uh, bilateral pneumonia. Okay, although there are there are none of the peripheral densities that, that densities that we observe in patients with COVID-19. But you know that uh, when you have a reading of bilateral pneumonia, you, we are always highly suspect of a viral pneumonia. And even at this point in time, that's the most common manifestation of COVID-19. The other important uh, part of the laboratory here, this patient's creatinine was really high, okay? So even though that uh, most likely this is leptospirosis, what if this is also, uh, there's also a concomitant uh, uh, co-infection with COVID-19, especially with uh, continuous uh, community transmission. So in a way we need to do the test and we have to rule it out. And uh, that's, that's one of the rationality that uh, why we need to rule out because we have to separate this patient purely on a lepto management and uh, not, it should not be, this patient should not also be in, in the COVID uh, floors. So uh, the current test that we are using, we did uh, SARS-CoV viral RNA and uh, this patient's test was negative. We did an RT-PCR lepto, part of our protocol here because uh, we need as much as possible, a shorter turnaround time to diagnose a patient with lepto the soon as possible time so that we can, especially for those with, uh, who, are, who have severe uh, presentation because we know that early management can really make a difference in terms of uh, higher rate of survival compared to higher rate of mortality. Uh, we ordered for a leptomat, which was during the time sent out to the Philippine General Hospital. But uh, because of uh, RT-PCR positive lepto, then uh, uh, we managed this patient as uh, having severe leptospirosis. So here we tease out some of the uh, uh, similarities, okay? So we'll start first with the similarities of lepto and COVID. So I think... Uh, you're all aware that uh, this is an acute febrile illness, same as that with uh, COVID-19. And it can also present with any of these uh, systemic manifestations, either in the form of myalgia and headache. And uh, in most patients with leptospirosis, especially for those who with severe lepto, then uh, there is associated elevation of your transaminases and can also present with severe uh, pulmonary manifestations in the form of ARDS. And these are also the same clinical manifestations that we've seen in patients with COVID-19. But we tease out some of the important differences here. Like for example, uh, this patient, uh, calf tenderness, conjunctival suffusion, and oliguria are really characteristic of a patient with leptospirosis. And somehow this may be an important factor to consider more on lepto rather than a COVID-19, okay? COVID-19, you'll have cough, you'll have silent hypoxia, sore throat, and other manifestations. And in the laboratory findings, uh, based on what we've gathered in most of our lep uh, lepto uh, cases, most of them always have leukocytosis and uh, like this patient, both have leukocytosis and elevated BUN and creatinine and presented with metabolic acidosis. 
where in, in most patients with uh, COVID-19, you have leukopenia. And in fact, this, the more severe the, the COVID-19, you'll have lymphopenia, and more or less, you also have normal platelet count and can also be uh, also found in, in patients with leptospirosis. But uh, the availability of inflammatory markers like your LDH, uh, D-dimer, ferritin, and your CRP more or less makes this uh, more of, uh, you have a significant elevation of these inflammatory markers uh, can make you, give you a more uh, higher rate that this patient is more of COVID-19 compared to a leptospirosis. Uh, there's this article that somehow this, the differentiate disparity uh, between uh, leptospirosis and that of uh, COVID pneumonia. And uh, based on this uh, number of uh, patients, total of 98, and uh, 57 of these are confirmed COVID, and 41 are leptospirosis. And specific laboratory exams that somehow uh, are significant that leans on uh, the presence of uh, leptospirosis, like uh, as we have experienced also here in San Lazaro Hospital, that you have more of leukocytosis in lepto and uh, elevation of your neutrophil. And then uh, the platelet count is really lower compared to the mean platelet count of those with COVID. But if you look at some of these uh, inflammatory markers, the only inflammatory markers that they considered uh, highly elevated uh, with the leptospirosis is the seroactive protein where you have uh, 138 and then for COVID-19 is 40 and then creatinine is uh, really very high, no? but in the, that's, the, that's why one, uh, they consider this as some of this uh, important disparity that you can differentiate based on these findings that more lean on lepto over that of uh, COVID-19. Okay. So there's this article that somehow uh, um, tells us the, the importance of considering both and the presence of these overlapping symptoms because of that cytokine storm is also present in patients with uh, leptospirosis, especially for those with severe leptospirosis. And at the same time, since steroids are also, or can also be given part of the treatment, not only for lepto, but also as we have, as we have seen now in, in most of our COVID-19 patients that requires oxygen, uh, part of the standard uh, treatment now is the use of your uh, steroids, okay? So these are two separate uh, infections, but uh, producing illnesses with similar spectra driven by the appearance or the due to your cytokine storm can also be common and can also be a co-infection that is somehow challenging to the clinician. With regards to the epidemiological investigation, uh, this is the this is the one of the important aspects that we have to consider. Uh, we know that COVID nineteen uh, can also be tracked with the direct contact with those patients who have uh, known positive for COVID nineteen. But with leptospirosis, it's a no crossing path, with, meaning it's, it's difficult. There's no there's no index patients, so meaning it's it's related with the environment, and that's why you have not only clustering of cases but also cases that are. Uh, common in some areas in one barangay that, is, that has a flooded area. And that's where you highly suspect that uh, when the, there are flood, flooded times during flooding times, you have to highly suspect and consider leptospirosis as part of your important differentials in any patient presenting with fever and other systemic manifestation. So uh, this, I'd just like you to share with you at this point our uh, uh, census of uh, leptospirosis. No? So compa comparable to 2019 and 2020, we have around 176 cases of leptospirosis in 2019. And compared to 2020 last year, there's really a significant drop in the uh, uh, number of cases in 2020. No? So for 2021, we have not yet collated the data yet, but uh, a significant drop here. This is also the start of the pandemic last year. And you notice that uh, less of the cases were seen in 2019, 2020 compared to 2019. For, for reasons, probably, uh, some of these patients are afraid to proceed to San Lazaro Hospital when the time that the government declared also San Lazaro as one of the 
uh, referral hospital. So th th this may not be uh, uh, an indication that the cases of leptospirosis in 2020 was, uh, uh, was low. So leptospirosis, as uh, we have always mentioned, this is a domesticated a primary disease of domesticated and wild animals. And in our country, the most important uh, source in the uh, trigger is always the flood because uh, rats, uh, the rats infestations, particularly in urban area is really very high. And you know that the urine is the one that's uh, uh, loaded, uh, loaded with the leptospires. And this is why uh, we encountered a lot of these cases during flood. This is the data coming from the different uh, Manila hospitals in 2009 when we had that uh, uh, severe flooding and uh, more or less the signs and symptoms are, are, are non-specific, but fever is the most common. You have myalgia, cough, tenderness, malaise, headache, chills down the line, okay? Depending on the severity of the clinical manifestations, okay? So, one of the uh, important part here is really to the, the, the high index of suspicion, uh, especially in this uh, time of this uh, pandemic, okay? And we just like to show you here the, the criteria for diagnosis of leptospirosis. So aside from the symptom, the presence of uh, manifestations, important also to consider the epidemiological uh, uh, risk of exposure and uh, flooded area or wading are two most important part of the clinical history that we always have to, to elicit, okay? Yes, there are tests that we do and uh, use for leptospirosis, okay? But again, uh, some of these tests may not be available in some primary or secondary centers, okay? And that's why the, the, the manifestation is really very important in the history of uh, exposure, okay? So these are some of the the tests that we use. And uh, in our setting, we use the MAT, we use the uh, IgG, IgM. We also, uh, we don't have that luxury of the isolation or, or culture. And uh, uh, sometimes that result will take around three to five days before we get the result. And uh, most of the time uh, we get false negative uh, based on the, the most of the history of patients with lepto because of late uh, arrival to the hospitals, they have been taking antibiotics. So that might also affect the yield of the positivity of both of these uh, tests, okay? So this is just to show to you uh, the current test and timing, which is quite uh, crucial uh, for, for us to have a better yield for leptospiral uh, infection, okay? So specimen and leptospiral tests that can be used during the first five to seven days these are the tests. And then after seven to 14 days, these are also the available tests that you can utilize. Now, uh, a patient with leptospirosis, the most important part here is recognition. Those patients with a higher rate of fatality, meaning mortality. And we need to know who are these patients. And that's really an important aspect in the initial clinical assessment, okay? Who are those who are having moderate or severe leptospirosis because uh, these are the patients also with a, a lower survival. So I'm just showing you some of the important indications of uh, admission. And uh, here, uh, once the patient will have these uh, manifestations, of course, these patients, with, when they have these pulmonary manifestations, severe hypoxemia, they're also in the state of severe metabolic acidosis. And we know that uh, crucial to this is really dialysis and the other parameters that uh, can somehow like uh, uh, ECMO is one of that. No? And uh, this is quite challenging in an area where you don't have the luxury of those uh, 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 therapeutic regimen that can uh, somehow have value in terms of managing the patients, especially with these patients with uh, severe leptospirosis. So general guideline in the management of leptospirosis, of course, is still hydration, correction of the electrolyte, okay? There's a role for antibiotics, especially when you catch the patient earlier. And uh, for severe cases, um, these are an important supportive care, renal replacement therapy. And I think uh, Dr. Danilan will also discuss this later on. Ventilatory support and blood products uh, may be required. So we'll just go through some of the important uh, antibiotics so that you'll have a good review of what, what 
how we manage our patients here. Okay, so with mild leptospirosis, these are the list of your regimen. And then for those with severe, we still use the penicillin or ciprioxone. Okay, and these are some of the alternatives that can also be helpful, especially if you're in an area where you don't have this uh, first line regimen. Uh, prophylaxis uh, is also part of uh, prevention. Actually, the most important prophylaxis is really uh, uh, shying away from flooded areas. If you cannot, if you cannot uh, prevent from going to this flooded areas, you have to protect your skin okay? as much as possible because uh, the entry through, through cuts and skin lesions are the most important uh, uh, area of entry of most organisms. And that's why you'll have uh, this uh, infection. So this uh, prophylaxis uh, regimen is given based on the severity of exposure. You have low risk exposure, moderate risk of exposure and high risk exposure. So if you have a low risk exposure with only single history of wading in flood and uh, uh, we, we are contaminated water without wounds, cuts or open lesions of the skin. So I think the, the regimen here is 200 milligram of your doxycycline. And then for moderate risk, you have wounds, cuts or open lesions or accidental ingestion, then you have to give two, uh, 200 milligram three to five days but you have to start it immediately. So there's a window period that uh, you have to give it as much as possible within 24 to 72 hours from uh, exposure. And if there is continuous exposure, then this is also the regimen. So something that uh, most of our local government units are also using for, for their uh, patients of history of wading and uh, an important prophylaxis. So, Generally, uh, when I talk about uh, leptospirosis, even if you have, don't have the test yet, the result of the test, it's important that uh, clinically you have to really commit that if this is leptospirosis, you need to manage them no? accordingly because early recognition and early treatment are very important in the clinical outcome of uh, patients. So my, this is my last slide. Take home message here, given the uncertain spectrum of COVID-19 presentations and variable sensitivity of laboratory tests for SARS-CoV-2, there's always a risk that without a high index of suspicion, alternative etiologies may be overlooked while pursuing a diagnosis of COVID-19. And similar clinical manifestations shared by COVID-19 in some infectious diseases, so I'm not just talking about lepto, but other infectious diseases, especially those endemic in the Philippines, is a concern raising more awareness to expand such differential diagnosis and post really big challenge, especially in areas where resources is limited based on the availability of specific and highly sensitive uh, diagnostic tests. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Jean Solante, one of our infectious disease experts from San Lazaro Hospital. Jean, we learned a lot from your presentation and I'm sure our audience has uh, questions so stay with us for the panel discussion. And we're now going to move to our, our reactors. We have two reactors. And our first one is someone who you always have, have seen on the webinar. I guess, I guess Raymond, yung mga kasama natin ngayon, mga suki lahat, ano? Parang, yes. Yes. parang <laughs> not, none of them are first timers. So no, anyway. no, none of them are first timers. Oh, none of them are first timers. Okay, so anyway, thank you, Dr. Jean. And uh, let's go now to... Um, our uh, former Dean of the UP College of Medicine and lead of the Philippine Vaccine Expert Panel, Dr. Nina Gloriani. And she's going to talk about the pathophysiology and the public health part of, um, of leptospirosis. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nina. Yes, thank you, Susie and everyone. And thank you to our main presenters, no? So Dr. Mahar and Dr. Jean, who I work with a lot on COVID also. So you have actually shown the interconnectedness, the re relation between these hazards and infections and that we all have to work together to actually uh, try to address them. No? What is this? What's happening? So I'll, I'll have to... Um, dapat punta tayo sa slideshow. Slideshow. Baka yeah, ito. let's go to... Ay, no, wala. No, wala. There you go. 
Ah, 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 so bumaba. Ba't ganon? <laughs> Sorry, I'll go. No, no problem. So, ah, let's go. Okay. So, there you go. Okay, perfect. Now you know, of course you know, that uh, leptospirosis used to be mainly an occupational exposure. So we're talking about animal handlers, so we're garbage workers, abattoir workers, farmers, and anyone who actually handles animals. But you can also get lepto from leisure activities. So in some of those, yung mga, white, uh, yung mga rafting, rafting just sa mga rivers na yan. And of course, now recently, the floodings. Just to note here, you can be directly or indirectly get exposed to the urine of infected animals. Like so, ito to yung maraming mga animals na to. How do they get into you? Cuts and abrasions already um, presented earlier. Although your intact mucous membrane, so yung nose, mouth, eyes, so if you get into a flood na talagang mataas, no? the, the lepto can get into the mucous membranes, but water lag skin is also parang a risk factor. No? Kapag antagal nyo na nasa flood, lalambot yung skin niyo and this leptospira can actually enter. And of course, ingestion of contaminated food or water. And just to tell you that we have tested in our LEPCON program in UP Manila that water and soil samples from the National Capital Region and other regions are positive for pathogenic leptospira. Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Jean also mentioned about the pathogenesis somehow. So it can actually affect many um, organs of the body. But take note, this is for humans, and we have dealt with that. But in animals, we have all of these animals who can get abortion, hepatitis, nephritis, and pa, mo, mo, meron pang uveitis, dacentitis, or reproductive tract. Uh, infection, but there could be mild infection in domestic animals that could pass unnoticed. Okay, so you have your, ano, ano ba yung tawag doon sa kanina, yung teaser na questions. I hope you answered all of the above. Kasi we have data from actually earlier than 2010 when we had the LEPCON program established at UP Manila. So we have studied all of these uh, animals here and found by antibody positivity, and we also were able to isolate the leptospira from their kidneys or from their blood. So all of these are actually positive or can carry the um, leptospira. So of course, you know rats are the main carriers or maintenance hosts of leptospirosis, but please take note that dogs are also very important uh, carriers of the um, bacteria, the leptospira. So whether sick or apparently healthy, you can get also. So if you see any dog swimming during flooding, chances are nag-urinate yung dog doon. Kung meron siyang um, lepto, pwede din matransmit that way. And we also have data for pigs sa mga abatwa, sa mga slaughterhouses, to yung mga pwede, no? cows, goats, and carabao. So and what we have found is that we have different, uh, a different set of uh, serovars. Ito yung mga types ng leptospira. Uh, very, very specific to certain um, areas or geographic areas. So, uh, tawag sa kanila. May tawag sa kanila, no? Serovar, Manilay, galing sa Manila. Serovar, Los Baños, yung mas, mas older na mga versions. Uh, serovar, Canicola. Pyrogenes, Gripotyphosa, pero maganda mga pangalan nila in Terrasovi. And some of them were isolated or uh, are able to infect some of these animals better than others. So kun kunwari, you will see later, no? yung Manilay, Los Baños, Canicola, marami sa dogs. Yung poi, ah, hindi natin nasulat yung poi sa pigs. Yung Terrasovi sa carabaos or sa cows. And then and many others. Okay, so how can we control uh, leptospirosis? So interventions could be at the at three levels. The source of transmission, so yung environment, pwede naman urban planning, oh, kaya nga pumapasok lahat yung sinabi ni Dr. Mahar kanina. No? What do we do about all of this? The pollution in the rivers, creeks, garbage, canals, and so on. We have to control the transmission route. We have, well, I don't know how, how much rodent control we're actually following here, but if 
vaccines are available, but mainly ngayon yung vaccines are available for dogs. I do not know if the Philippines, uh, some of our livestock get vaccinated, but in other parts of the world, they vaccinate horses, cows, and uh, uh, other animals. No? And of course, we have to control at the level of the human host by proper diagnosis and treatment, as Dr. Jean uh, showed us, and of course, PPE. So maybe just to also say that uh, after a five, seven year actually program on leptospirosis, we were able to produce a leptovax vaccine containing the serovars that are more prevalent in the Philippines versus uh, we have uh, imported leptovaccines that are being given to our dogs here. But you take note that uh, not all uh, well, these imported vaccines do not contain the serovars that we have here in the Philippines. So we're looking at uh, fighting leptospirosis with a local vaccine, but that uh, is not yet uh, very advanced. Uh, we're still going to do animal studies. So just putting all together, you know what to do. Uh, we have said all of this. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I hope we all uh, list, uh, what's this learn from what we're hearing today. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's Dr. Nina Gloriani of uh, the head of the vaccine expert vaccine panel and also former dean of the College of uh, Public Health and very interesting no na hindi lang daga, meron pang ano no, mga aso, baboy, no, iba-ibang iba-ibang animals. So we will talk about that a little bit more later. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think, you know, really I think in this webinar, we wanted to talk a little bit more about the environmental context of, of these diseases and um, so that we're, we're well aware of you know, what we can do now, what we can do as a community, what we can do as frontliners. Okay, so our next speaker, uh, again, not someone who you are unfamiliar with. Kilala nyo na siya. Uh, we have had her before and um, she has... Uh, she has some very interesting information to share with us, also reactor to the presentations of Mahar and Jean. I am very privileged to honor, um, to, to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is the Deputy Executive Director for Education, Training, and Research Services at the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, who I've also known for a long, long time, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ramina Penji Dangilan. Penji, welcome to the webinar. Hi, Susie, and thanks for uh, inviting me again. And I'm really very happy to share with you our data. Again, go ahead, Benji. What? Okay, you have to go to slide slideshow. There we go. Hey, right, slideshow, Muna, Benji. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something very interesting, which is leptospirosis and COVID-19 as a co-infection. And I'm going to try and compare that with uh, our population uh, with leptospirosis only and COVID-19 only. So because we are a uh, national kidney, we majority of our patients are really kidney patients and patients on dialysis. So we're talking really about a very severe group of patients uh, with very high mortality rates. So here we have COVID-19 um, and leptospirosis as shown by Dr. Solante also earlier. There are certain, and in this uh, paper, uh, incubation, uh, you're not seeing my progression of slides, presentation. Um, I've colored um, those uh, signs and symptoms that may differentiate one from the other. So uh, if, you're, if your patient has conjunctival suffusion, myalgia, and then progressing to renal disease and uh, um, jaundice and hemorrhage, we look more about this is probably a leptospirosis patient, or this is probably a patient um, even if they have combined disease, that will uh, manifest mainly as leptospirosis. On the other hand, if your patient uh, has more of 
uh, upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract symptoms, then probably you're thinking more that this patient is going to be more uh, manifesting COVID symptoms. Okay, now again, uh, COVID-19 and leptospirosis, as mentioned also previously, we have what is common in both of them is really a cytokine storm as a main precipita precipitating event. Majority of patients have good outcomes unless they have ARDS and multiple organ failure. And uh, this can occur rapidly in the patients. So that um, the institute has developed several types of um, scoring systems so that we can uh, predict which of the patients from the ER uh, already, we can already predict who's going to really have a very uh, stormy course, who are the patients uh, we will do early intubation, um, and who we will be very aggressive with our management. You can see here that if you have a patient with COVID and ARDS, mortality goes up to more than 50%. And uh, lepto with ARDS, again, mortality goes up to 26 to 61.5% in these papers. And uh, high-dose steroids, has been used in the early management of severe lepto and severe to critical COVID-19. It's, it's found to be very effective as well for the cytokine storm. In uh, NKTI, uh, for our severe patients uh, on lepto, uh, our protocol is to do pulse therapy for three doses with methylprednisolone and to give them cyclophosphamide uh, 500 milligrams IV for a single dose. So you can see that we're really looking at the um, immunologic uh, pathophysiology of this disease. And from March 2020 to July 2021, COVID-19 co-infection. And I'm going to present uh, some of this early data to you. Now, who are these patients with a co-infection? Looking at some of their demographic data, see here that in the occupation, um, some of them had high risk, 43% uh, had high risk exposure. So they were factory workers, vendors, construction workers, fish port transporters. So they had probably exposure to floods or dirty water. Then low risk in 33%, uh, lineman, driver, supermarket employees, call center agents. Again, maybe they had to walk in the floods and then we had also some who were unemployed. If you look at where they came from, since we're in Quezon City, a majority of our patients came from Rizal. We have Malabon, Pasig, and of course, Quezon City. And again, looking at exposure, 71% had exposure to or reside in a rat-infested area in about 71%. Um, and none of those with exposure took prophylactic medications. Now let's look at the time from onset of symptoms to first consult. You can see here that uh, it was between four to seven days with a mean of five days. And all of them presented with myalgia. 95% had fever, nausea, or oliguria, jaundice, and conjunctival suffusion in 60%. And none of them had anosmia, adjusia, disjusia, or hemoptysis upon admission. So our usual um, symptoms that we see in uh, those with COVID were not really present. However, in our emergency room, all the patients are going to have a COVID swab so that we could uh, cohort them accordingly. Now, let's look at some of the baseline demographic data. Uh, here we have a very interesting now uh, presentation for you. I put here in the middle, those presenting with lepto and COVID. Uh, as I said, there were 21 patients. Then here on the left side, we've had a study done on 41 patients with severe leptospirosis. Severe meaning um, they had severe lung disease and they were uh, on dialysis. And on the right, you have severe COVID um, alone. And this is, again, a study on 102 patients. Uh, and let's compare them to our middle group, which are those who had the co-infection. So looking at the age of these patients, you can see that those with lepto, both uh, lepto plus COVID and lepto alone, 
were younger patients. So mean age was about in their 30s, while those who were having severe COVID alone were a little, were older at 55 uh, mean age. Majority of them were all male. Uh, comorbidities, you can see that more of the patients uh, who had COVID alone will have our comorbidities because they're el elderly, while those, um, the younger group uh, will have very little, uh, few patients with comorbids. And uh, mean arterial pressures were uh, similar for the severe lepto and lepto plus COVID. Our WBC counts were uh, elevated for the two. And um, for the creatinids, you can see that um, we get the patients with severe lepto, so their creatinids are elevated. They will probably need acute dialysis. And um, in our study here on severe COVID, uh, we took the dialysis population. So let's see how, we'll, how they will do later. Looking again at uh, more data, uh, we wanted to compare the inflammatory markers as shown here on the left. And as you can see, um, the mean um, LDH was higher among those with lepto and COVID as compared to severe COVID alone. Look at ferritins, again, much higher in those with uh, co-infection compared to COVID alone. Procalcitonin, which measures bacterial infection, we can expect it to be higher in lepto because uh, that is... Uh, the bacterial infection. You can see it's not high in severe COVID because infection. If you look at HSCRP again, another inflammatory marker, higher again in the co-infection. And um, just looking at this uh, data without any statistical analysis yet, um, I would say that majority of those with a co-infection will have higher inflammatory markers, which might mean since both diseases are characterized by severe inflammation, um, cytokine storm, that uh, they will then manifest with even higher inflammatory markers. Looking at the PF ratio, you can see it's lower for our patients with a severe leptospirosis um, and not that bad yet at baseline for our other two groups. And uh, SOFA scores, which are scores to predict uh, mortality, um, were quite poor, already elevated in our severe leptospirosis patients. Now, just looking at the lung involvement at baseline, we can see that um, we have a uh, really severe, majority of our severe lepto will have already four quadrants involved, while those with severe COVID on admission will have three quadrants involved. It's data that we haven't looked at yet in our co-infection, so that will be uh, very interesting to see. Looking at our therapeutics, uh, all of our patients receive steroids. So I mentioned that our protocol for severe lepto is to give steroids. Severe COVID, uh, all the patients are placed on dexamethasone. So um, the co-infection patients, they will receive steroids as well. Only our severe COVIDs were put on HFNO. Um, look at the patients on dialysis. So our, all of these patients with severe disease 100% um, of them will be on, on dialysis. And our co-infection, 76% of them required dialysis. Hemoperfusion, which is a treatment that we give for patients because of the severe inflammatory response and the cytokine storm. Half of those with severe lepto were put on hemoperfusion, 24% of those with a combined infection, and 33% of those with severe COVID. And then we had ECMO, uh, plus hemoperfusion that we did in about half of the patients on, um, who had severe lepto. What are our patient outcomes? Uh, again, looking at overall mortality, you can see that it's only 14% uh, for patients who come to us with leptospirosis. So in 2020, we had 188 patients with leptospirosis and 14% uh, overall mortality. If you look at laptop plus COVID, it was more benign, only 21 patients and 5% overall mortality. And if you look at our COVID in 2020, we had a 26% overall mortality because again, majority of these patients are uh, on dialysis. Now, if we look at the mortality in patients with severe disease, so we extracted uh, those with severe infection, meaning they were on dialysis, 
or required uh, a lot of oxygen, HFNO, or mechanical ventilation, then uh, we have here half of the patients on lepto will have died. If you have the co-infection, if we look at those with severe disease, again, 33% of them will have a mortality. And again, again, COVID, because again, these are patients on dialysis, the mortality jumps up to 47%. So these are very ill patients, very uh, prominent uh, uh, inflammatory response and um, something that we really need to treat very aggressively. And uh, we have special treatments for them, like hemoperfusion. We now do ECMO for patients with severe disease uh, so that we can improve um, our survival. Now, just to end, I just wanted to show you, okay, we are worrying about lepto differentiated from COVID, but let's not forget that we can also have lepto and differentiate that with dengue. And here is just one slide to show you in this study where they compared uh, patients the incubation period um, is the same. A mean age is lower for those with lepto. And common findings, again, were myalgia, uh, oliguria, ipteresia, anemia, leukopenia, low platelets, high ESR, low albumin, and AKI, acute kidney injury, those with lepto. Mortality was higher in patients with lepto. And here you have some predictors of death. And this was interesting because they tried to uh, do a sort of a scoring system. Uh, this is the receiver operator characteristic that would favor leptospirosis as a diagnosis. And that was if your WBC was more than 11,000, ESR was more than 40, CREA was more than two, bilirubin more than two, CK more than 500, and albumin less than three, then those patients would favor a diagnosis of leptospirosis. So thank you very much for listening. And I just wanted to show you the COVID uh, war that we make out of our gym. Um, this was in 2018 and 2019. And um, just to tell you that we are now in a lepto surge at the NKPI. Yesterday, we admitted 10 patients with COVID. Today, half the day, we already have five patients in the ER again with severe lepto. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that uh, really exciting po no na information that you have brought uh, on new information po uh, Dr. Penji uh, and that that picture that last picture really uh, epitomizes po the work that's being done at the NKT mo. So uh, thank you po for that presentation. Uh, we'll call on the different our different resource persons po no to our panel. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mahar Lagmay, Dr. Jean Solante, Dr. Nina Gloriani, uh, Dr. Penji Dangilan, and also Director Eric Tayag of uh, DOH. Uh, he was supposed to give his opening remarks, but uh, we'll ha have him start the ball rolling during the panel. But before we start, uh, let's take a very, very quick break uh, as, we, as uh, all of our uh, speakers are trying to um, well take a breather also while they're uh, opening up their videos for the special public service announcement for today. Sigurado ka na ba sa si reservations natin? Oh, naman. Bakit bihis na bihis ka? Oh, magiging escort mo ko eh. Mukhang may date si Lola at Lola. Ilagay mo kaya ito? Ang ganda naman. Maganda yan. Special ang lakad natin. Ano, ready ka na? Ready, ready na. Mom, Dad, aalis si Lola at Lola. Oh, anak, after lunch. Saan ang lakad niyo po? Para sa atin lahat ito. Magpapabakuna kami dahil mahal namin kayo. Dahil mahal ko kayo, magpapabakuna ako. Thank you again, TVUP. Ang cute-cute po ng ating mga infomercials po. No? So, uh, thank you so much. This uh, public service announcement is really part of the COVID Communication PSA and one of the many outputs <coughs> of the UP, on UP, of, uh, UP research entitled Communicating COVID-19 in Post-Quarantine Philippines. It's headed by none other than our lovely VP for Public Affairs, uh, VP Neni Pernia. It's funded by the DOS, the PCHRD, and the DOH through the AHEAD HSPR project. Okay, Dr. Susi, I will have uh, Dr. Eric Tayag uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, Dr. Tayag, uh, any thoughts? Uh, well, you could start uh, with your own uh, uh, talk po, uh, just to get the ball rolling for our panel, sir. 
Okay, thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Susie. Thank, um, I'm sorry I was uh, a little bit uh, late earlier. I had to be at the DOH vaccinating because we're ramping our vaccination against COVID-19. And uh, yours truly is one of the bakunador. Okay. Uh, just now, it was uh, announced that all cities and municipalities in the national capital region uh, each one has at least one uh, Delta variant case. So that's the situation right now. That's the breaking news. And the breaking news from Dr. Danilan is that the leptospirosis. Alam nyo po sa mga nanunod po ngayon, ngayon pong tag-ulan, may tinatawag tayong wild diseases. W, waterborne diseases, diarrhea. I, influence and other respiratory tract infection. L, leptospirosis. At saka ang D, dengue. Napag-usapan na po yun, pero tandaan po natin, naka-ECQ po tayo. Maliban sa National Capital Region, kasama dyan ng Iloilo, Cagayan de Oro, Himoog, at Laguna. Yan po ay dapat niyong malaman sapagkat uh, alam namin, marami nag-aatod baby sa inyo at ayaw na ayaw niyo itong ECQ. Subalit, ito ang tanging paraan. Uh, yung modeling po natin lumalabas na kung hindi tayo mag ecq ay eh baka sa September, kalahating milyong kaso ang madadagdag na COVID. Liban pa dyan sa mga napag-usapan ngayon na nagkakaroon na ng pagtaas sa leptospirosis. Matapos po kasi ang pagbaha, dalawa hanggang apat na linggo, nakikita natin ang pagtaas yan. Uh, ito po ay isang babala sapagkat maliban sa COVID-19, ang hirap-hirap po ma-differentiate ang lept to dengue. At ang siste pa, pwede po may co-infection. At uh, ngayong hapon po, tayo po ay pinalad nang sa ganun ay maintindihan natin ng lepto sa konteksto po ng COVID-19. Over Raymond, Susie. Okay, thank you very much. That's Dr. Eric Tayag. And uh, thanks for the updates and for joining us despite your very, very busy Schedule, we, can, we, we cannot imagine how busy you are, but thank you for joining us uh, at the Stop COVID Deaths webinar. Okay, so, um, you know, it's very interesting, um, Raymond, pag naiisip ko, no? These are two diseases with very different modes of transmission. One is waterborne leptospirosis, and the other one is through droplet spread. Uh, in some cases, it, it's airborne in certain conditions where you have very bad ventilation. And, um, and yet, it seems that uh, we will continue to see, to see these multiple, and I think Mahar used the word cascading disasters, no? these multiple, multiple um, threats to health. So I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of these problems come about because of congestion. Yung siksikan... Yung mga tao, siksikan yung tinitirahan nila. Eh, no? Parang our cities are so jam-packed, so congested, that you know, no matter what we do, this is, this is really going to be a continuing problem for us because when we have more people living together, then all of these threats are magnified by the, by the, just by the sheer number of people who are, who are living close to each other. So... Of course, this is a bit of a provocative question for Mahar. And the, for the others, I'd just like you to also give an opinion. Mahar, is it time for us to start moving to the provinces? Um, actually, mahirap talagang magmanage ng disaster kapag uh, overpopulated or densely populated yung community. Um, meron kaming ginagawa ngayon sa Manila. No? Uh, dyan sa may coast area. We calculated bawa magkaroon ng tsunami no? uh, may inundate yung lugar na yon, yung barangay it will take them one hour para dapat makaalis na sila dun sa lugar. But nung binilang namin yung mga tao uh, parang lumalabas na kailangan within one hour makapag uh, mag six by six truck sila na napakadami no? That virtually impossible mangyari yon parang parang daan-daan na 6 by 6 trucks just to take them take them all out of that area. So that only goes to show na pag maraming tao eh, hindi madali ang disaster management especially sa response. 
And all of these things, kailangan maganda talaga yung plano eh, including yung development, yung the growth of the community. Going back to your question, kailangan na ba tayong pumunta sa mga probinsya? Uh, yun ang gusto ko sanang i-recommend. Ano? Pero hindi naman basta umalis ka doon, umalis ka sa Manila, tapos lilipat ka doon, eh masusod na yung problema. Kasi may hazards din doon. No? Mas madali lang kung mangyari yung problema na hazard, may impacts, ay ano, mamamanage na mas maganda. No? Pero the best way really to, to manage natural hazards is to plan the community well. Get all of the development, yung mga settlements and plans across all sectors. Eh, uh, the growth of the community are in places where there are no hazards. Kasi meron naman eh. <laughs> uh, in fact, parang nung binilang namin yata, 40% of the country is safe from these floods, landslides, at saka mga storm surges. No? Yung earthquakes, as long as Ma, ma, mabantayan natin yung building code that it is uh, well implemented and we follow it and we avoid the fault rupture zone kung nasaan yung mga faults will be okay. No? And when the hazard strikes and the people are out of harm's way kasi wala dun yung development I, we will be alright as well. Di ba? Parang, because we have to live with all of these natural hazards. No? Uh, ngayon lang nga natin nagagamit itong science and technologies to show us where all of these flood-prone areas are, where all of these landslide uh, potential areas are. But we have to mainstream that science into the plans of the community. Uh, obviously, Metro Manila, uh, alam naman natin, it's not, ako sasabihin ko na, it's not well-planned. It was not well-planned. You can see it sa mga overpass na parang umakyat ng Mount Everest. Yung mga overpass na nilalakaran, uh, you see that, di ba? Yung parang kang umakyat ng Timbuktu eh. So ang taas-taas nun. It's not well planning. Yung mga sidewalks natin, they're not well planned. There's not enough space. So with community planning, good comprehensive land use plans, disaster risk reduction management plans, climate and disaster risk assessments, uh, all of those cities and municipalities should be planned well, such that, uh, going back to your question, if we move there, people will be out of harm's way as well, and there will be no disasters. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Mar. Uh, Dr. Nina Glorian, would you like to comment a little on congestion? I mean, again, right, uh, from a public health point of view, and you showed us you know, the different... Uh, occupations of people who are who are affected. Go ahead, Mamina. Uh, yung, yung congestion talaga, that's a very important factor in transmission. No? The, the more congested, hindi lang, hindi lang yung mga respiratory illnesses, yung congestion also would breed yung mga problems in sanitation and all of this. So lahat halos ng infections will be affected. So makatama nga na, I don't know, some of us will have to be going back to the provinces or, or decongest Manila or do not allow people coming in kasi mas, mas double yung ating mga worries and concerns with all of this. So basically, ano, a lot of people will get more, in, more infected, especially with the respiratory illnesses. And by the way, Ang lepto na nakita namin do sa aming mga, yung dating uh, sa lepcon, ang mas marami doon, although I, the, our clinicians can tell us, marami doon may mga lang, ano, no, pulmonary hemorrhages. So, sa, sa bagay, iba din yung root naman noon. Pero still, uh, yung congestion will be playing a big, big role in uh, these ano, problems. Yeah, I'd like to ask Jean also because Jean, recently you've been talking about tuberculosis and how it has increased during this pandemic. Would you like to share a little bit more information on that? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Susi. No, uh, yes, no. Uh, we have observed uh, a lot of uh, we we have three groups of patients with TB and COVID. No, one uh, those who are on still on medication. Uh, early part or the intensive phase of medication and they got COVID in the community. Uh, those who have previous TB and has been completed treatment, they have COVID. And then those with HIV who have TB and with COVID. So 
So these are the, the, the three groups that uh, we have in, our, in our, most of our hospitals. And they really present with uh, severe manifestations. Um, in the group of HIV and TB with COVID, okay, I think the most dom predominating symptom is the HIV and the TB. Okay? And uh, the, the, the usual clinical presentation is respiratory failure, but they, they usually don't present with the bilateral, the crown glass, but it's more of the cavitary and, and severe immunocompromise. Those with a, a history of, those with during the intensive phase of TB and then had COVID, these are the, 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 patient, the patients that really present with uh, florid manifestations of uh, COVID. So in a way, I think the message here is that when you have these co-infections, okay, some or one of the infections there can dominate over the other. Okay? Like for example, if I can get, give my take with lepto and COVID, uh, this data presented by Dr. Dangilan, uh, those lepto patients whose age group are in the younger age group, they may present with, uh, uh, they may be positive with COVID, but I think the most dominant presentation is still lepto because of the acuteness and then you have more of the, uh, uh, the load of the leptospires, which really triggers more of the pulmonary hemorrhage and the renal failure over that of the COVID infection. Right, yeah. Benji, would you like to comment on that, on other infections? I mean, I guess, you know, in terms of uh, infections that later turn into kidney disease, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Benji, you're on mute. Uh, that's very true, Susie. Uh, it's been shown in the literature that if a patient develops acute kidney injury, even without any other comorbid factors, the fact of getting acute kidney injury, uh, if you follow them uh, forward, a uh, good percentage of them will develop chronic kidney disease. So as in COVID, we're seeing that it's producing permanent lung damage, the long COVID sort of type of patient. Uh, in, uh, with the kidneys, we are also seeing the same thing. So it's very important to really try to prevent getting um, a kidney disease. It's so important with lepto that we do our prophylaxis with exposure. It's something that's we're, what we are really trying to bring that out in the media so that with uh, prophylaxis, you can prevent these very severe complications um, of um, having acute kidney injury and requiring dialysis. So um, uh, I would like to comment on the comments of Dr. Solante. I agree with him no, that the younger people will tend to manifest mainly with leptospirosis. Um, so you can see from our data that their mortality wasn't that high. Uh, but if your patient uh, has very severe acute deterioration in their lung findings, then um, they will probably be manifesting more of the COVID and probably these are the a little bit older uh, elderly people. So again, that will help us. But the way we treat them is probably very similar because we're very aggressive with steroids um, in, these, in all of these patients. Um, of course, the pulmonary support, again, also very aggressive. So, uh, but we're happy to see that the co-infection, although inflammation-wise, the markers may be higher for the co-infection, uh, their um, survival is better you know, in uh, a lot of these patients. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Eric, did you want to comment on this? Yes, um, Susie, not every area in the country will have facilities like the NKTI. So the physicians will be encumbered with deciding if this is COVID-19 or something else. Okay, it's good that uh, Jean and uh, Dr. Benji are were able to share some parameters as well as uh, Dr. Nina, but in other areas, this is going to be difficult. They're not going to get ferritin levels. They're not going to get, uh, uh, they will not determine uh, a cytokine storm. They just have to, have that experience. And so therefore, I'm recommending that the NKTI, San Lazaro Hospital, 
should have established their telemedicine so that the other areas can benefit and they can have telementoring so that uh, in their situation, even without these parameters, they can actually make a diagnosis and treatment so that not everyone goes to the National uh, Kidney and Transplant Institute. This is going to be scary for us especially if there's really will be a surge of the Delta variant. Over, Susie. Thank you very much, Eric. I think that that, uh, that suggestion is going to you, Raymond, uh, as the head of the National Telehealth Center. Baka this is time for us to, to think through with the PGH group, and Chancey mentioned is, is with us also. Maybe she can comment on it later, but to think through how do we bring the expertise. And I, I like the idea of telementoring. Uh, sort of helping our doctors out there who don't have the facilities of NKTI and San Lazaro. So, uh, Raymond, that suggestion is for you. You don't have to yes. <laughs> Very but timely rin po kasi I think uh, PhilHealth has already worked out uh, a telehealth-related uh, package po for reimbursement. So, that's something to think about. There are also enabling policies na uh, together with the DILG that the DOH and Phil Health have uh, moved forward. So that's something that uh, will be helpful po, uh, for, the, well, for the future, especially uh, 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 even after wala na pong COVID na meron po tayo. Yeah, um, I, mean, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think, you know, uh, since we're talking about it and there is seemingly an increase in leptospirosis cases, maybe offline we can have a conversation with Benji and and Jean and, and see what we can do. But anyway, Raymond, let's go to the answers to the questions of our fun quiz. Go. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, TVUP, may we have the, well, at least the Mentimeter po. No? Yan, okay. Thank you so much. Dalawa po ang ating katanungan for today. Uh, I don't know if uh, yung ating mga regulars notice. I think this is the very first time that we have two questions na in Filipino. Maybe it's uh, the buwan ng wika effect, but it's something, siyempre, buwan ng wika, tas may effect ako, no? So, <laughs> so <laughs> ang dalawang katanungan po ay, ay, anong hayop ang nagdadala ng leptospirosis? So, the options that we have here, rats, dogs, cows, pigs, carabaos, goats, uh, all of the above and none of the above. There's at least 9% uh, from our respondents who answered all of the above, but the overwhelming majority chose rats. And then for our second question, our second question po, there we go. Our second question, ano ang mga sintomas ng leptospirosis na katulad ng COVID-19? Uh, ito na po, it's uh, a little bit dispersed, but 86% chose all of the above, uh, followed by 8% ng fever and then, medyo tay na po yung iba. Joint pain, muscle aches, chills, headaches, and none of the above. So, uh, who would like to give po? I mean, just a reiteration of the answer to the first question po. I think si Dean, uh, Dean Nina Gloriani should answer the first question. Okay. Uh, ano, lahat, no? As I uh, presented earlier. But of course, ang talagang main maintenance host, yung tal kasi ito mga rats, hindi ito nagkakasakit. Kaya healthy sila, lalo silang dumadami, pero dala, dali, dala nila sa kidneys nila, sa ihi nila, yung lepto. No? But all the others, we found na may mga antibodies, so may exposure ito. Itong mga dogs, especially, no? yung siguro, baka yung mga askal, yung mga, kasi yung mga nasa private, yung mga, may mga breed na dogs, ay may mga bakuna, at least kahit partially protected, dahil nga hindi kasama yung yung mga C-reverse that we have, pero may partial protection, but those around us, lalo yung mga nakita nyo sa mga flood, pag hawak-hawak nila, nandun sa flood, napaihisi si dog, yun ang mangyayari, magkakaroon ng environmental contamination. And then do sa rural areas, we found especially yung goat, na actually may na-isolate kami, na isang um, C-reverse from goat in the, sa Region 6. And then sa carabaos, mataas ang positivity nila. So if you handle these animals, it is possible. Yung mga abattoir workers, yung mga uh, occupational at least, occupationally at least, we have to be very careful with our PPE. Doc Nina, merong mga nagtatanong dito eh. Yung cats daw. 
Pusa. Hindi namin na-test eh. Although may konting reports na pwede rin positive ang cats. Dito sa... Mahirap kasi maghabol ng pusa dito. Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Susie? Yeah, go Susie? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. na natin yung pusa habulin yung rats. O ngayon, <laughs> importante yung pinag-uusapan niyan sapagkat Kung rats yun, alam na natin yung intervention. Kasi baka mamaya, eh, aso ang nakikita nyo po. So, dapat yung basura po natin, nadibigpit po natin ng maayos. Yan po inahanap ng rats eh. Over, Susie Raymond. Thank you very much, Eric. And I wanted to ask, uh, again, going back to Dean Nina, no? you were saying that the rats don't get sick. Yeah. So yung mga daga, hindi po sila nagkakasakit. Parang maligalig lang sila, dala-dala nila yung leptospira na yan. Pero hindi sila nagkakasakit. Pero din Nina, yung mga aso ba, kalabaw, baka, kambing, nagkakasakit ba sila? Yes, nagkakasakit sila. So although mayroong mga parang mild infection na will go undetected as I mentioned, pero itong dogs, they, they get sick. Yung sinabi ko, yung reproductive tract can be affected. Meron din yung liver nila, kidneys din nila affected. So, eh, syempre, di naman ako by vet med, pero may tumingin do sa aming mga tines noon. So, ah. may, meron silang signs and symptoms na parang human din. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so I think we all learned something, uh, a lot of things today. Let's go to the second question, Raymond. Second question po. Yeah. Thank you, TVUP. Second question, uh, who do we throw this to? Dr. Susie. Uh, maybe to Jean. Or Penji, ano ang mga simptomas na katulad ng, lep, ng, ng COVID? Let's ask both of them. So let's okay. go to Dr. Jean Solante. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, although the most common is fever, but uh, they also have muscle aches, joint pain is also part of that. And then, yeah, all of this, all of the above uh, is the answer. Okay, Penji, would you like to add something to that or you have any comment on this question? Yeah, although it's common in both, I would say if a patient complains more of myalgia, especially tender uh, myalgia and then uh, conjunctival suffusion, that's more of lepto. Uh, so the pro, the orange, yes. orange colored, yeah, okay, yeah, and very painful tender muscles. So that's more of lepto. The way we're looking at it here. Okay, great. Okay, Raymond, let's go to our ano, our uh, upvoted questions. Meron ba tayo from the audience? Well, we have a couple, Dr. Susie, but I'd like to get this one. Uh, this one comes from our regular, Dr. Joseph Tortona. Uh, it's about uh, convincing the general populace of strict COVID-19 protocols plus strict lepto health protocols. Uh, how, how, how should the government do this? Uh, against the, well, isa konteksto po na maraming may problema po sa mga vaccination. I think you, a lot of us have seen the viral videos and photos, Las Piñas, Manila, etc. Uh, on how it became a little bit rowdy, kumbaga. And is there any role for the private sector in terms of disseminating that information to help? Uh, okay. okay. Maybe that goes to Eric. Eric, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Susie. Uh, it's about repeating the same messages again and again and again. They heard it. They have to hear it again, again, and again. So for our ECQ, masking, not, not going outdoors if it's un unnecessary. And uh, of course, if you have the symptoms, you really have to have yourself tested. And if you have any doubts, this is the DOH COVID-19 hotline 1555 so that we can make uh, things easier for you. That's for your teleconsultation. Uh, UPPJH also has uh, telemedicine services and many are having this. And it's going to be difficult unless uh, people are actually listening and uh, we have to show them how it's done. That's how uh, behavior are changed. Uh, it takes time, but uh, people can get very anxious and, uh, and uh, they will put their guard down, especially those who ha have been fully vaccinated. That's a no-no. So you still have to think of social distancing, 
going only outdoors if necessary. Indoors is a no-no if these indoors are settings do not have the ventilation. Over to C. Raymond. Thank you. Raymond, do you have one more question? Because I think we're approaching the top of the hour. So any quick question we can throw our, our time. Right. So I'll, I'll be combining this question and this our most upvoted question po, no? And with, with one of uh, similar questions po that we have uh, outside of the Zoom. And it's about uh, prophylaxis for, ano po, for like taking do doxycycline. Um, any, any particular message that our doctors may need to impart. Just be very, very clear as to uh, prophylaxis intake po of uh, the drugs, uh, lalo na po na tagbaha po ngayon. Uh, Raymond, can I, can I get the... Go, go ahead, Dr. Jean. Yeah, so uh, actually that's part of the prevention. No? And I think we have emphasized as much as possible if, if we can prevent from uh, uh, waiting in the flood areas, that's the most important uh, prophylaxis or protecting ourselves. The, the antibiotic prophylaxis, you just have to be careful with this, no? And it should be guided by a prescription or it should be monitored by a doctor because of uh, possible side effects. Or sometimes we tend to uh, take more than what is prescribed, something like that. No? So you just also don't want to escalate a uh, uh, problem of drug resistance. That's all, Raymond. Okay, thank you, Jean. Eric, did you want to add to that? You're on mute, Eric. Okay, um, I'm in now. Um, what we can do is that not to actually recommend this strongly without supervision because uh, this can uh, easily be abused. And so we want to warn everyone that using the antibiotics, there are contraindications, especially to children less than eight years old and uh, women who are pregnant. And the, it needs prescription. And several studies have shown that uh, giving this prophylaxis favors those uh, uh, persons at uh, high risk, like the, those uh, risk, um, involved in rescue and relief. Okay, over, thank Susie. You. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. So again, no, let's not self-medicate. I think the, the deeper message there is Relax lang tayo. Let, let's stay calm because if we, I, I understand people are anxious, they're worried, uh, they're seeing people get infected with COVID, but we have a role to play, I think, in just helping people calm down because if you're not calm, uh, you won't be able to think think right and start doing things that might might not really help you, but actually could, could be damaging. So, you know, take a deep breath, when you're with people who are very anxious, ask them to, to breathe with you. And this just, ano, parang let's calm down. No? Lilipas din ito, huhupa rin ito. Pero nasa sa atin itong mga frontliners na bahagi tayo ng pagpapakalma ng tao. Kasi pagka nagpapanik talaga yung mga tao kung ano-ano na iisip nilang gagawin no? out of fear. So we don't want that. We want people to have information, but we want people to stay steady and calm. All right, so we're going to ask our panelists to give their uh, departing words. Uh, and so we'll start with uh, with Benji Yang Angko from uh, Benji Dangilan from uh, from the National Kidney Institute. Benji, go ahead. Yeah, so um, it's really left to season now. So it was because of the floods maybe a week, two weeks ago. So everyone, please be careful. Um, if you're exposed to floods or, or you're in an area where or like you work in a specific place where you have a lot of exposure, please see your doctor, your barangay health workers. You might need prophylaxis and it will help prevent severe disease. We see a lot of patients going into acute kidney failure, needing dialysis, needing a respirator, going on ECMO, and we don't want to see this. So please uh, take care. Wear the proper... Uh, Clothes, no? If you have to wear a raincoat, boots to do work, please do so. Um, also, uh, we want everybody to take care because it's COVID. Um, as mentioned by everyone, stay at home if you don't really have to go out. And uh, you'll really be helping your family um, if you stay safe and stay home together. Thanks so much, Susie and Raymond. 
Thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Danilan from the National uh, Kidney Institute. Let's go to uh, Dean Nina Gloriani. Please, your parting words, ma'am. Yes, parang dapat sabihin, stay home. Kahit lepto yan, kahit COVID yan. By coming from the vaccine expert panel, no? so yung bakuna. So I'm glad na dun sa on the street, the ano, uh, they, they still want to get vaccinated. And that's really very good kasi nga itong Delta variant, ang kalaban natin dito, uunahan natin siya. We do not want it to take over us and any other variant that will come in. So yon, repto and COVID, ayo natin yan. So yon. Stay home. Okay. Stay home. <laughs> Stay home. Thank you very much. Dr. Jean Solante of San Lazaro. Go ahead. Thank you. Sundan ko na yung sinasabi ng boss ko sa VEP. No? So tutuwa tayo na maraming magpa nagpapabakuna pero uh, alalahanin din natin, we have to remind everyone, pag nagpabakuna kayo tapos may baha, you can always prevent from getting lepto. No? So mas, mas maigi na mag-ingat pa rin, especially for this uh, time na mataas pa rin ang tagulan at marami pa rin pwedeng magkasakit ng lepto. Salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Jean Solante of San Lazaro Hospital. We'll go to Mahar Lagmay of the UP Resilience Institute. Mahar, go ahead. Nakamute kaya, Tamar. Okay, let's see what's happening to Dr. Mahar Lagmay. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was prevented okay. from unmuting and showing my <laughs> video. <laughs> anyway, ang problema ng disasters ay problema na haharapin natin hindi lang ngayon. No? Hindi in the next years and in the next generations. No? So kailangan natin uh, talagang gawing part ng culture natin na maging maalam, na palaging iniintindi uh, and conscious tayo sa mga problema, sa mga natural hazards. And we need to plan. We need to always plan, know our neighborhood. No? And we have to be educated on, the all, all, on all types of hazards na kailangan natin malaman it's a lo very long process. I think education is very, very important in getting all of the Filipinos to be able to contribute to the disaster management efforts of the country. Because it's not just the problem of government. It's everybody's problem. So the solution also will come from the people. No? So lahat ng mga ating early warning actions, uh, early warning systems as well, need to be people-centered. We need uh, to be engaged. All of us need to be engaged. No? And uh, it's very important to anticipate even the bigger events that, than, that, than what we have experienced or what we know. We have to incorporate that, it in the planning process from the city, uh, municipality or LGU level down to barangay level, even up to family level. So dapat nag-uusap-usap tayo palagi. Palagi natin inahanap yung mga answers to some uh, questions about hazards, uh, where they are, maapektuhan ba kayo, and all sorts of other information that we can get. Pag wala, hingiin sa gobyerno, hingiin sa mayor, pag meron, kailangan alam natin yon. And all of us have a role to play. No? Kung alam na natin, we have to uh, tell our uh, neighbors, our cousins, no, our relatives of the information that we were able to learn. So we must develop a culture of safety because uh, hazards will always be here in the Philippines. No? We are in a country that is in the typhoon belt, in the Pacific Ring of Fire, and we have all sorts of hazards that we know of except probably for snow-related hazards, and we really need to develop that kind of culture for us to survive. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's Dr. Mahar Lagmay of the UP Resilience uh, Institute. And uh, let's have our final words also from Dr. Eric Tayag of the Department of Health. Eric, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Susi, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mahar, Dr. Jean, Dr. Nina, and everyone, including Raymond, and uh, everyone who's watching now. We can do this. Doon sa mga kababayan natin na uh, biglang naniniwala po at hindi nyo alam kung yan ay fake news, yan ay chismis, ang may papayo po namin sa inyo po ay kumuha kayo na informasyon sa trusted sources. Ang dami-dami po yan. 
Ang hirap-hirap po kasi na mali na nga po yung na kuha nyo information, sinishare pa po natin. Hindi po magandang uh, behavior at practice yan. Hindi po natin yan kailangan ngayon. Hindi po makakatulong. Uh, dito sa webinar nito, ayan, nakakuha kayo ng tamang informasyon, pero mag-iisip pa rin tayo. At ang huli ko masasabi po, ang informasyon pong dala namin ngayon, baka bukas luma na. So, hindi to disclaimer. Ganun to talaga ang informasyon eh. Nagbabago. Sino mag-aakala na magkakaroon tayo ng Delta variant na ganun kabagsik? So, ito po ay inaantabayan na natin kung mukha tayong informasyon. Kailangan po itaas natin yung ating science literacy. Uh, hindi po nakakalungkot po na marami sa atin ay mababaw ang science literacy. Kaya, ayan, nagkakaroon tayo ng problema sa messaging. Over, Susie. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Eric Tayag from the Department of Health. Raymond, um, before we call on uh, Chansey Manchit, I think you want to do the evaluation. Go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for the wonderful parting words from each of our speakers po. No? As shown on the screen, I don't know who closed the, pan the, pan the poll, but there are five questions here. For those who are asking, uh, we'll try to figure out how to reopen it. But the five questions are as follows. The panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. The panelists were well prepared and organized. The panelists spoke clearly and audibly. The panelists used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And number five, the panelists contributed to new perspectives and knowledge on managing various co key COVID-19 health issues. It's a Likert scale. So, uh, I'm just looking at the ano po, no? uh, except for one, I think uh, all of them reach 90%. Uh, and we're very happy because it's, uh, that's very consistent with our previous 63 webinars uh, that we have had so far. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Very much, Raymond. So we'll keep that. We'll keep that open, or it's is it closed now, Raymond? Pano ba yan? Someone, someone closed it. Eh. So I'm. Uh, so that's why we're able to share the results. <laughs> oh, we close. Oh, sige. Okay. Try natin buksan yan. Okay. So let's go now to uh, our closing remarks from uh, Chancellor of UP Manila, Dr. Carmen Sita Padilla. Manchit, please go ahead. Take the floor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Susi. Um, uh, Dr. Mahar Lagmay uh, started open our session today and he and he discussed the commonly encountered natural and man-made disasters in the Philippines. And note that the Philippines is part of the Pacific Rim of Fire and the Typhoon Belt. For the natural hazards, he mentioned the volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and the heavy rains uh, leading to flooding. For the man-made disaster, I think it's worthy to note that he mentioned that even the reduction of the La Mesa Dam water level is considered a man-made disaster. So Dr. Mahar warned us that planning must be anticipatory and we should not only look, plan for the phenomena, but also plan for the consequences of the hazards. No, it's just like, you know, when you have your earthquake uh, drill, you're just not planning for the drill, but actually also planning for what will be the consequences of an earthquake after the, consequence, after the phenomenon. So Dr. Maglagmay reminds us, be anticipatory in planning. We've got to know, know our place of residence and work. And, um, and, you know, we're all part of a city. He said that we've got to be, planning should be at the level, the city or municipality level, because all sectors must be involved. And it is in this kind of meetings where hazard maps are discussed. And Dr. Lagmai mentioned that they will soon upload these maps in their website at the Resilience Institute so that we can plan as a team. But I'd like you to go back to the replay because he actually showed the, the lessons from past disasters. And I think, you know, learning from the past is so important and it is a reminder on how we can prepare better. So Dr. Lagmai actually ended his, uh, his sharing by reiterating that we need a whole of society approach for disaster and that we must use science-based solutions. Now our next two uh, speakers, uh, our next two doctors, Dr. Solante and Dr. Danglin actually shared um, a couple of um, uh, data. So uh, allow me to present their, their, uh, their points together in this uh, part. 
one, they they share their experiences in their respective hospitals, San Lazaro Hospital and NKTI. I I really appreciated the data that you know when uh, Dr. Salante said that in San Lazaro they had a 13% increase in leptospirosis uh, this year compared to last year, and the fatality rate that's also slightly higher of 11.4%. Now, of course, NKTI being a highly specialized hospital for kidney diseases had the additional challenges of having a lot of patients undergoing dialysis. But what was actually interesting for us now, and I'd like to go back and review them, wherein they show the differences between, the similarities rather and the differences between the two con uh, conditions. In other words, COVID alone, leptospirosis alone, and then COVID and lepto together. But what is clear when there is a history of a waiting in the flat, then of course, you know, you first think of leptospirosis. Now from both presentation, they show the challenges of the overlapping symptoms like, you know, fever, myalgia, headache, and ARDS. But there were there are certain clues, both of them mentioned this. You know, when you have the, the conjunctival suffusion, the cough tenderness, when you've got anuria, oliguria, elevated the VU and creatinine, somehow it tells you that you probably are dealing with a, with a um, leptospirosis. There were excellent discussions. I'd like to go back to the replay and look at the um, uh, presumptive diagnosis, definitive diagnosis, and as well as uh, there were tips on what will be the indications for admission. Now for management, uh, it's, it, it's important now to see how they're managed individually and together. But what I've heard from Dr. Daniela and Dr. Solante is that treatment is always aggressive because of the complexity of both conditions. Now, the mention by Dr. Dangilan on their study in biomarkers is probably a good clue for us clinicians and other health workers in the audience, because what they've shown is that um, the additional biomarkers like LDH, ferritin, CRP, and so on, show that they are actually have higher values with, co with, the, with, the, with the higher values. So I'd like you to go back to the replay, go back to this part about, you know, the symptoms, the treatment, admission, and so on. But what is clear from both is that what is important for us clinicians, for us health workers in the audience, is that early recognition and early treatment will, will improve survival. Now, um, the, the next uh, reactor actually is Dr. Gloriani, Dr. Nina Gloriani, who talked about the connectedness of disasters and infectious diseases. And um, instead of just limiting it to flooding, she did mention that there are occupational exposures that actually put a, a person at risk for, for leptospirosis. And that will be some exposures of some uh, uh, occupations wherein you're exposed to animals. No? And of course, there are leisures also that are included. So it's not just flooding. And also from her lecture, we learned that it's not just the rats. They have enough data. They have looked at other animals, cows, dogs, pigs, caragals, carabals, and goats, showing to also levels of leptospirosis. So uh, when you are exposed to these animals who are infected and you have a cut or abrasion in the skin, of course, you, there is the risk for that infection. I do want to mention the three modes of control uh, for leptospirosis. And she talks about control at the source of transmission. Wala na talagang may lepto. Number two is controlling transmission route through vaccinations of the animals. May bakuna para sa lepto. And number three is control at the level of the humans, and that's for the early diagnosis and treatment. So we, you've got to look at these three angles of control to have an effective uh, approach to the control of leptospirosis. Now, Dr. Eric Tayag reminded us, when you're in the province, you will not be able to get uh, all of these biomarkers on hand to help you make a diagnosis. And for that, Dr. Eric Tayag recommended actually that we establish the telementoring for the provinces uh, so that they will have the opportunity of actually engaging with specialists who will tell them you know, how to manage these patients with joint infection. COVID plus leptospirosis. And I'm going to challenge doctors to, to take this on as a, as a substantial project uh, to make sure that you know, we are able to help them. And I think there are efforts now both uh, at the Department of Health as well as UP Manila and PhilHealth to make sure that the telehealth becomes a, a regular component uh, in the care of our patients. So, so in closing, let us remember that uh, COVID-19 might eventually be results. 
leptospirosis can eventually be eradicated, but the Philippines will continue to be a disaster-prone country. So let us keep the messages of Dr. Mahar, anticipate, plan, be engaged, regardless of what your profession is, all of us have a role to play to make sure that regardless of what infection comes our way, it will not complicate the presence of a, of a, of a disaster in our country. So sa araw na ito, hindi lang bakuna para sa COVID ang dapat tandaan. Meron din bakuna laban sa lepto para sa mga hayop. Back to you, Susie, Dr. Susie and Raymond. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much. It's UP Chancellor, uh, UP Manila Chancellor, Menchit Padilla. And um, okay, so I think we had a great webinar. I'd like to thank everyone. Thank all of our panelists, our presenters for excellent presentations. Alam nyo yung mga speakers natin, kinakarir nila yung mga PowerPoint nila, no? To get you the latest data because we want to continue to be a credible online community for you, bringing you the best speakers. And next week, we have another very exciting topic. We are going to talk about COVID-19 and teenage pregnancy. So sabi nyo, bakit naman, bakit naman pag-uusapan nyo? Alam nyo ba na itong 2020, there were 70,000 70, teenage deliveries for the whole year. That's like, if we average it, it's about 191 girls at the ages of uh, 10 to, parang 10 to 50. Ewan ko anong age pa ito. Well, we'll find out, no? But Teenage, okay, so teenage means up to 16, 17, 18. Okay, yung 18, no? Pero karamihan dito yung 10 to 14 years old. And they project that this will double in 2021. That means about 350 deliveries of young girls who got pregnant during this pandemic, the lockdown. What are the circumstances for this? We will find out. Bakit nangyayari ito? And as frontliners, what are we supposed to do when you have a teenage, a, a pregnant teenager who probably, let's say, has COVID symptoms? What are you going to do? So we're going to have um, very good experts. Uh, some of you have already met. Secret na lang, di ko muna kung sino. Pero topic po natin, COVID-19 and teenage pregnancy. So don't miss it and invite your teams to watch. Lalo na yung mga ano, no, team natin sa barangay, mga midwives, etc. Kasi ang dami. <laughs> Parang ang dami natin problema. Hindi, kaya natin to. Okay, Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie, for that, uh, well, a really quick sneak peek into our episode for next week. Uh, we will have, uh, well, it's it's a little bit different na naman po, no? In terms of... Uh, how the structure will be. Uh, pakiabangan na lang po kung sino po ang mga ating mga uh, resource persons who will be attending. And hope this is of interest, uh, especially to everyone. Uh, this will be co-sponsored uh, with the Philippine Obstetrics and Gynecology, Gynecology Society po. Uh, so before, but before we conclude, uh, I'd like to acknowledge po uh, the very hardworking team behind the Stop COVID That's webinar series. Thank you to each and everyone. Maraming maraming salamat po. Also, for those who are asking about the certificates of attendance, yes, we are still uh, sending out certificates and only those who have attended at least 50% of the time sa webinar po, at least in the Zoom duration or uh, sa webinar duration po, will be eligible to receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, so please take note that you can also watch all of these sa playback po in all of the social media accounts that we have, especially in Facebook, but also in the YouTube channel of TVUP, you will see on the screen po, all 63 and will be 64 po, no? either tonight or tomorrow. Pwede nyo po mapanood po ilit ito. Uh, will be very, very interesting how we have evolved uh, through the last 64 weeks uh, sa ating webinar series. So this brings our webinar for this week to a close. We look forward to your company again next week. It's a date. Together, we can stop COVID deaths. So keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. Me remains unseen. I'll keep your hand in mine. Let's say a prayer one more time. I 
know you long for home But I am here, you're not alone I'll stay with you until the coast is clear The others fame before my fears The others lives before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? My oh God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head Until my Hold on to the word he gave This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain before my fears The others vows before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my head work until my head dies. The others fade from my fears The others lives before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? For God alone, what's this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'll keep my word, you word is mine The others fade before my fears Pushing on the spine of tears Please take us through another day Just hold my hand And I will hold the line I will hold